It's a strange world that we live in, and the future isn't what it used to be. We've always had such an infinite capacity for creation and compassion and joy, but also for rage and cruelty. You see, I think your life and everything is a non-linear system. We understand linear systems, cause and effect, positive correlation and negative correlation. The problem with a non-linear system is that the interactions quickly become too complex. No one remains one person. And what if a conversation could change the way that you think about yourself and the world? And what if everything that you held to be true was somehow, in some way, wrong? I'm Dr. Mark Halloran, and you're listening to Deep Trouble on 94.9 Main FM. So, once again, it's time for Deep Trouble here on 94.9 Main FM. And uh, once again, I have Dr. Mark Halloran with me. And tonight, Mark is going to be interviewing Dennis Altman, who's a leading public intellectual in Australia and the author of a new book, Unrequited Love, Diary of an Accidental Activist. Professor Altman first came to attention with the publication of his book, Homosexual Oppression and Liberation. And this was compared to, at the time, this was 1972, and it was compared to uh, Jermaine Greer's The Female Eunuch and Peter Singer's Animal Liberation, and was considered to be the first serious analysis about the gay liberation movement. 1972, gee whiz, that's a, a long time ago. And interestingly, he went to a Quaker school in Hobart mm. and it's still going strong. The largest mm. Quaker school in the world. Although, as you'll hear, Dennis said that it's not overtly Quaker. Mm. Let's talk about some of the things that are going to come up in tonight's interview. I think he's got a very refreshing take on the culture wars. Peter Craven, who reviewed the book, said that He's a kind of an unusual blend between the radical and the conservative. But, gee, he's known a lot of leading public intellectuals. He does talk about some of them, and he had dinner with Michel Foucault. He knew Gore Vidal fairly well. He's very honest in his appraisal of some of these public intellectuals. For instance, he said about Gore Vidal, Vidal read Dennis Altman's work with ferocious attention when it was about him and only then. There was something in the book that I vaguely remember that it was in relation to Gore Vidal, which was that fame could never be enough. Anybody who had fame, they would always be searching for more. I mean, he felt that way about Gore Vidal. Right, interesting. And he had been visited by a rather dazed Gough Whitlam at mm. one stage, and Dennis said that Gough didn't seem to know why he had come. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not bad to uh, rattle off those kinds of anecdotes and memories. It goes to show that uh, Dennis Altman has been at the centre of many historical moments here in Australia and in America. Okay, so without any further ado, as they say, let's have a listen to you, Dr. Mark Halloran, talking with Professor Dennis Altman. Hello, Dennis. Yes, hi, Mark. Well, thank you first for um, agreeing to do the interview. Sure. Um, I was interested in your experiences and your memories of childhood and growing up in Tasmania and your memories of your parents. Well, that's a very big question. I'm not quite sure where I should start. Uh, we moved to Tasmania when I was seven because my father got a job with the Hydroelectric Commission my father was an electrical engineer who had fled Vienna in 1938 when the Germans invaded and had a couple of positions in Sydney and then in Melbourne, which didn't really work out. So they moved to Hobart. My mother was also the daughter of refugees, but had come to Australia as a child and they'd met in Sydney and married during the war. So my memories of Hobart really go from 
I guess, right through my schooling from the age of about seven to my 21st birthday when I left to go to study in the US. What was your experience of growing up around that time? Mark, that's a very broad question. I'm not quite sure how one answers that. Well, I know that you talked about you were very proud of your parents when they went to a meeting, which I think Gough Whitlam also attended before he was uh, Prime Minister. No, Um, you're actually confusing two different stories. All right. um, Because I was proud of my parents. They went to an early meeting which was called to protest the white Australia policy. And then later on, the first time I ever met Gough was when he came to the University of Tasmania at the time when he was under great fire in the Labor Party because he was trying to change their policy. I think what I really have to say is I grew up in Hobart in a period when having parents with a, with European accents was strange. It was very, very different to Australia today. And Hobart, of course, had relatively very small, in fact, uh, non-Anglo population. So in that sense, I think we were somewhat odd. Uh, My mother never really liked living in Hobart. It was basically a necessity forced on us by my father's job. I went to the only Quaker school in Australia. And oddly, uh, just today, I got an invitation to, I think, a 50th anniversary of the Friends School in Hobart, um, which I... Really, my entire schooling, my sister did her entire schooling um, at that school, which is the only Quaker school, one of the very few co-educational schools uh, in, probably the only co-educational school in Tasmania at the time. Although it was a Quaker school, there was very little of a religious atmosphere, and my parents were both really quite determined to be secular, so we had no religious upbringing. I'd say that the school was sort of very low-key, non-evangelical Protestant in its outlook. I mean, I learnt sort of the classic Protestant hymns, which we would sing at the end of the year. There would be some sort of big end-of-year speech night function. Um, But the headmaster was certainly Quaker. A couple of the teachers were Quakers, but the majority of the staff were not. The majority of the students were not. I mean, there's a sort of historical oddity. Quakers had settled, I think, early on in Tasmania. The Cadbury factory, which of course now is no longer part of the family Cadbury Holdings. But at that stage, I think the Cadbury had brought a number of Quakers to Tasmania. But basically, it was a, as I say, low-key, non-denominational Protestant atmosphere. The most religious of my teachers, I recall, was a rather forbidding Baptist who loathed Catholics. So in a sense, I remember we studied Shaw's place and Joan, and our teacher said things that today would be regarded as extraordinarily offensive about Catholics. I know I I read about your father uh, coming from Vienna, being a Viennese Jew, and uh, someone in your family being a contemporary of Freud. Uh, But I was interested in what you'd written about in terms of Freud's insistence that sexuality is never totally fixed. And there was a phrase in your book that sort of captured my attention, which was your utopian reading of Freud. And I was wondering what that was. I mean, you're actually right that I was very influenced by Freudian ideas, not because of the family connection. I mean, it's strange because there was a quite deep family connection that I really knew nothing about because... I think not unlike many people who were refugees. My father did not talk very much about what had happened in Vienna. His family were dispersed. His brother went to New York. His sister went to Vancouver. He came to Sydney. But later on, and as a teenager, when I met my grandmother, who had survived the war and had actually gone back to live in Vienna, I then began to discover that Yes, there was actually a quite close family connection. My grandmother uh, had known Freud quite well. I think that my uncle, who was a doctor, might have studied under Freud. But my reading of Freud, I think, really began probably 
when I was, I'm not even sure if I was aware of Freud as an undergraduate. It may have only been as a grad student when I was in the US. And I was very attracted to Freud's understanding of human sexuality as central to a lot of how we see the world, to Freud's idea that we all repress a great deal of our sexual urges, and the ideas that Freud developed, which then sort of move off in different directions and they're different schools who follow Freud. And I was certainly, as you say, I was attracted to the utopians, by which I mean the people who combined a reading of Freud with quite strong socialist politics. And in the time that I was back in New York in the early 70s, I was very influenced, I think, by reading or having already read Herbert Marcuse, who I think one could classify very much as a utopian Freudian. What is the combination in terms of getting a utopian reading of Freud? Because to some extent it's, well, I mean, now it's considered within psychology to be somewhat unscientific, you know, drives and these sorts of constructs which are unfalsifiable. I think that's right. I mean, I would say that psychology has developed into one of the most arid and unhelpful disciplines around. <laughs> I'm obviously not very sympathetic to the, quote, scientific bend of psychology. Yes. Uh, an awful lot of what psychologists seem to do is spend a huge amount of time and effort measuring things, yeah. refusing to recognize that human beings are complex, that emotions are very hard to measure. I think that the way one has to read Freud is the way one reads literature. Mm. That is, I think it's true, but it's not provable. And I think that, for example, to go back to some of the basic things that Freud wrote about, such as the importance of dreams, the insight that we get into human behavior through dreams, the idea that we are constantly repeating, we have patterns that we repeat over and over again, and in particular, I'd say Freud's sense that the human sexual drive is much more complex than is often recognized. I think all of those things stand up, but they stand up in the way that a great novel stands up. So I think the way to read Freud is not by applying, quote, scientific method, but rather by reading him metaphorically in the way you might read Shakespeare. You know, we, we learn more about power from Shakespeare than we do from political science. And I would argue we learn more about human emotion from Freud than we do from the psych department. The other part of it was that you're combining socialism and uh, socialist theory, politics with Freud, and, and to some extent that, that's got to play out at the level of a society. So I wondered what a, a Freudian utopia looked like. Oh, look, I think the point about utopias is they're unrealizable. Right. That they're, you know, they're the things you might aim for, but we're not going to get them. I mean, I think somebody who seriously believes you can construct a utopia is likely to be a very dangerous fanatic mm -hmm. because I don't think utopias are achievable. But I think that when we talk about a utopian reading of Freud, and I don't remember using the phrase, but I'm quite happy with it, I think it probably is a sense of a society in which people are far less prone to repressing their urges. And this is interesting, and now I'm going to call on actually mainstream psychological research just to contradict what I've said earlier, because we're allowed to do that, aren't we? Yes, of course. Um, I mean, Freud would approve, I think. There is a lot of mainstream psychological research that suggests that the people who are most homophobic are often people who are repressing their own homosexual urges and mm. desires. I think that's a really interesting example of where there is, in fact, um, evidence or psychological evidence that bears out a lot of Freud's thinking about repression and sublimation. Um, I think that there have been some really sad and tragic examples of that we've seen over the last couple of years in what's come to light about the behavior of so many Catholic priests who are required to repress their sexuality, and in so doing, it often seems to have led to very distorted and perverse forms of preying on kids. You're listening to Deep Trouble. Dr. Mark Halloran in conversation with Professor Dennis Altman, author and pioneering gay rights activist, here on 94.9 Main FM. <laughs> 
I actually did want to talk to you about that, the idea of implicit biases and, and that repression, because I remember speaking to a, a friend who's a little bit older than me, and we were talking about our experiences of growing up in small rural towns, he in the UK and me here, and just the kind of learnt homophobia that becomes sort of ingrained in you that you gradually realise over your life, you know, implicit biases, thoughts, negative thoughts that come out. And and for him, he was it was an interesting conversation because he was gay. And so he said, yeah, I have the same things, you know, these things that I've learnt over time. I grew up in this really small, stifled, mm-hmm. small mining village and at, uh, you know, my late 40s now, it still plays out. Oh, I think that's right. I think that... I mean, I think it's great that somebody can acknowledge that. And, you know, I think there are clear and obvious parallels to racism. I'd be very suspicious of anyone who claims that they don't notice the race of someone when they meet them. I think, of course we do. We're programmed from early on by all sorts of social and cultural norms to do that. And I think the same is true of sexuality. And I think that You know, it's hard now to recognize the extent to which the writings of Freud about sex were so radical at the time, because now, of course, even people who claim that they have no interest, that they disdain Freud, and there's a whole school of writers who have attacked Freud very vehemently, but in fact, we live in a world in which a lot of our understanding of human behavior and human sexuality actually is derived from things that Freud and people like Freud uh, were writing about a century ago. In the same way, I think that the influence of Marx is there, even, you know, the right-wing neoliberals in the Institute for, I can't think what IPA stands for. The but, Institute of Public Affairs. Right. Well, you know, none of them would claim to be Marxist, but in a funny way, they're all, of course, shaped by a civilization which some of Marx's assumptions have just become taken for granted. I mean, even within psychology, but when most people think of psychology, they think of Freud, and the same thing with Marx, is that they've, they've essentially become part of the zeitgeist. Yes. Yes, I think I think that's right. Of course, they're also then used as terms of abuse. So if you read the Murdoch Press, you will yes. discover that our universities are totally controlled by cultural Marxists. Given that most people who control our universities seem to be middle-level bureaucrats who've come out of corporate Australia, that seems to me rather unlikely. But mm. I don't want to shatter the dreams of the Murdoch colonists. Yeah, I guess there's all sorts of different moving parts to that as far as I can see. I mean, one... It's that this term, the cultural Marxism term, has become extremely popular in a way of classifying far-left thought. And also, I suppose there are reasonable Marxist movements. I mean, Latrobe has a Marxist movement. But I do think there's an interesting thing that you write about in terms of left and far-left identity politics. And I wondered what you thought about some of the things which are popular in the Murdoch press, such as the cancel culture that occurs in America, you know, where the speakers are disinvited to campuses. Well, I think this is complicated. And in fact, it's something that the Trobe University at the moment is going through a, a very large scale discussion that one of my colleagues is intimately involved in about what sorts of limits should exist in a university environment around free speech. And I tend to err towards the more permissive side. So, for example, I would not want to ban Jermaine Greer because she has views on people who are trans that people who are trans find offensive. Yes. But some of the cases in the U.S., possibly here as well, have involved people who are so clearly bent on stirring up hatred that can very easily escalate into violence and into attacks that I think it is reasonable. So, for example, I would not allow, if I ran a university, which I unfortunately don't, that I suspect the VC would agree with me. I don't think any of us would allow a Nazi to speak on campus and call for the extermination of everyone who's not Aryan. I don't think there can be absolute free speech. So that I think the problem is that being offended is not the same thing as being threatened. And there is a a sense in which the two seem to often run together. Mm. Um, I don't have much sympathy with people who want to stop things just because they might be offended by them. 
you know, there are so many examples of explicitly racist attacks in our society at the moment that I think it is reasonable to draw a line. And where you draw the line is, I think, very difficult. And, of course, there has been a federal government uh, report, uh, Robert French, former Chief Justice, I think, did a report... And I think he was right. I mean, he said it isn't a great issue in Australia, but there need to be certain guidelines. And some universities, I know the ANU in particular has led the way on this, but as I say, La Trobe now is going through a very interesting and exhaustive process where they are really consulting right across the university to try and figure out exactly where you draw the line. Yeah, I think that because there is no clear line. I mean, there is no one who really wants free speech, unless there are extreme libertarians. I mean, on the the right side, the IPA wouldn't want to hear free speech from ISIS or something like that. Um, And usually the line is drawn around violence. But as you said, I think there tends to be a conflation now between offence and safety, and that seems to be the biggest problem. Well, I think that's true, but of course the right are equally prone to get very upset if they're offended. Look, I think the reality is we are living, and I think it's very sad, but we are living in an increasingly polarised political environment. And in an increasingly polarised political environment, tempers flare and people become more sensitive. And I really regret that. I mean, I regret that we don't have more possibility of discussion across very entrenched positions. And it has often occurred to me that, you know, if you pick up on a Saturday morning, if you pick up The Australian and the Saturday paper, they are basically echo chambers of each other. They're equally unwilling to recognise that there may be limits to the positions they hold. Well, I suppose that they're also playing to an audience as well. So they they know what sells to a particular audience. Look, I'm not sure about that. Certainly that's truer. You know, the examples I use is truer of the Saturday paper because Mm. it's not up for the mass media. But if you look at the mass Murdoch press, which is, you know, the Herald Sun or the Daily Telegraph, which I tend to read in cafes a lot because I'm curious what people are reading. What strikes me is most people aren't reading the political They're reading the sport. Uh, They're looking at the TV guides. Sometimes, like me, they might do the crossword. I think a lot of the political stuff is not why they buy the papers. The political stuff is, in fact, uh, increasingly, I think, something that is read only by people who already have strong views. And unfortunately, the media... Perhaps some exceptions with the Fairfax Press and the ABC, both of which I think really do try... you know, some sort of what they would call balance. But I think increasingly people, unfortunately, are exposed to media that agrees with what they believed in the in the first place. Mm. Well, I think that you're almost always at danger of falling into groupthink in terms of the people that surround you. I think it's, it's so incredibly powerful. And I think that's what people tend to acquiesce to. You know, you can see it in terms of people uh, talking to their communities in terms of following, like social media followings. People are very quick to change their view on something if the people in their following find it to be something that they don't particularly like. It's very hard to stand against the crowd, isn't it? Well, that, of course, has always been true, but I think you're right. I don't know if it's more true because of social media or we're more aware of it, but mm. certainly it's much faster, isn't it? I mean... Yes. People now are exposed instantly to views and there's pressure to instantly like or dislike or tick or not tick or sign up or all those things. And, I mean, this is not probably the place to have a long discussion about how one deals with that. I don't think any of us really do know how one deals with it because I think it has changed enormously the possibilities of political discussion and... I mean, I I have ambivalent feelings because I think they're both advantages and disadvantages um, to the way it works. You're listening to Deep Trouble. Dr. Mark Halloran in conversation with Professor Dennis Altman, author and pioneering gay rights activist, here on 94.9 Main FM. I know when I spoke to John Waters about his experience from the time that he made Pink Flamingos and his experience of the queer community 
at that time and then his experience now. And I wondered what your experience was at that time, so the 70s, late 60s, 70s, compared to now and, and the differences. Well, I think the first thing I would have to say is both he and I are now a lot older. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, th- I think it's important because often it's very hard to disentangle the fact that one is older from any sort of objective assessment of how things have changed. I mean, mm. clearly there wouldn't have been any sense of a queer community back in the 70s. Uh, the word wasn't used. It was the beginning of, well, not really the beginning, but certainly the growth of gay and lesbian politics in ways that had to deal with a very, very different social and cultural environment to the one that now exists. That is, we're talking about Western liberal democracies. It's unfortunately not at all different if we're talking about the situation facing people in many other parts of the world. Mm. And it's hard to disentangle the overall changes from the particular changes. So that there's a, there's a lot of nostalgia that I hear from people of my generation that I think is rather misplaced. And I think people veer between a sort of triumphalism and a regret for a lost past. And I, mm. I'd really rather avoid both of those if I can. I think the reality is all sorts of things are different and you can't separate what is different for someone who's queer from what is different in general in the society. The 70s were a period when many of the issues that seem now to be overwhelming weren't around. I think that young people today are much more precarious, much more pressured uh, financially, and they're living in, people are living in a very, we've already talked about this, a very different media environment. And, you know, if we go back to the question about social media, I think one of the great things that social media does is it enables people who are isolated, either because of where they live or disability or family and communities they're part of, it gives them access to a much bigger world. And for someone who's just coming out as, as lesbian or gay, that is actually enormously important. So that when people bemoan, as they sometimes do, and maybe John Waters did, I don't know, the 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 death of a lot of uh, traditional queer culture, yes. I think that has to be balanced against the fact that actually that wasn't available to yeah. everybody. And the internet has made things accessible to vast numbers of people who would never have had access, who would never even have known there were other people like them out there in the world. Mm. His point was around saying that he was just happy that people had the option to get married, have children, things that didn't really exist. So there there are extreme things. He talked about bars and things that, you know, even he, known for his shock value, things that shocked him. And he said the community's changed in terms of becoming more options around those other things as well, if people choose it. Oh, I think that's absolutely right. And there certainly are more options. And part of it, again, it takes us back to media. When I was growing up, there were virtually no depictions of homosexuality available, except in a few not very easily obtained novels. Uh, Now, of course, it's virtually obligatory for every soap opera to have a couple of gay characters. There are very public, prominent figures. And we have someone like Penny Wong, who in some ways is probably the most admired Labour politician in the country, an open lesbian married with kids. I think those changes are really important and enormous. And I certainly don't want to underestimate them. Which, And at that stage, I'd say, yeah, I think, I think the changes have on the whole been quite extraordinary and pretty good. Mm. Well, I was interested in that term, the term queer, because that's the term that you tend to prefer rather than LGBTQI, which has become ubiquitous. 
Well, it's becoming ubiquitous this year. I mean, I I don't think it will last. And I I think, to me, the attraction of the word queer is that it's much more flexible. Mm. It can last because it's pretty open. But I'm very aware that, you know, every generation will have its own terminology. And I was talking to people recently about the fact that some older people in the, quote, community, hate to be called queer. I can remember when some older people in the then community hated to be called gay. As I say, I like the word queer precisely because I think it's open-ended and because we need some sort of simple term. And that's, I think, the the best one we've got available. Uh, But I suspect that in 20 years, there'll be something totally different and it will sound somewhat archaic and out of date. I always thought of it as a reclaiming of a word of vilification by a community to some well, extent. Well, there is some of that. Um, but, you know, queer is used in different ways. I mean, as you know, because you've read um, Unrequited Love, you've, you've clearly read it very carefully. Yes. I have a bit to say about Agatha Christie. One of the interesting things about Agatha Christie is that She often describes characters as queer, but it's never quite clear what she means by that. And my hunch is that she knew exactly what she meant by it, which was she wanted deliberately to be very ambivalent. And I think that's part of the attraction, that there's a sort of ambivalence to it in a way that once you start adding up letters and every year another letter gets added on because somebody feels they've been neglected, I think that is a real problem. You wrote a book called The End of the Homosexual. And you've, I did. And you've stated things like the, the hope that the terms homosexual and transgender would disappear. Well, of course, I wrote a book called The End of the Homosexual with a question mark, which is <laughs> very important is that there's a question mark at the end. And I think yes. what I was really getting at, well, it was really a re- reference back to the very first book I wrote. And it was a, really suggesting that sexual identity is no longer for lots and lots of people a primary identity so that once it's taken for granted once it's largely accepted uh, you don't actually need to make a, a big fuss about it i think what we're going through at the moment is interestingly a very strident affirmation of trans identities yes. because that is something that's more recent, and I think also much more threatening. Mm -hmm. I think that people find someone being gay or lesbian, on the whole, not very difficult to accept, unless, of course, you're Israel Folau, in which case you find it extremely difficult to accept. But I think that most people at some level, whether they acknowledge it or not, find the idea of gender as fluid and the idea that Mm -hmm. somebody who appears to be male might actually think of themselves as a woman or vice versa. I think that is something most people struggle with. And I think we have to be honest and acknowledge, Mm. yes, it is difficult. It does go against a whole lot of very, very basic assumptions that we all make uh, from very early on. I mean, you know, the first question usually when, when someone has a baby is, is it a boy or a girl? We don't, I think, ever ask of a two-week-old baby, uh, is she a lesbian? It would yeah. be a meaningless question. So I think that's actually the really interesting set of issues that, that are currently around in uh, sexual politics. You're listening to Deep Trouble. Dr. Mark Halloran in conversation with Professor Dennis Altman, author and pioneering gay rights activist, here on 94.9 Main FM. In Unrequited Love, you have open discussions about some of the things you have questions about, like children being assigned a gender or uh, looking at medical transition and things like that and when that should occur for transgender children. Yes. Yeah, so I wondered where you found yourself with that. Well, I think the reality is that people get very upset by this, is that I'm quite conservative about interfering too much with, with biology. And I think that... I'm torn between enormous both empathy and admiration for people who are trans yes. because that is an enormously difficult thing to live through. I mean, I've known people who've lived through transitions. It's heartbreaking. It makes you realize just how entrenched 
society's views of gender are. But on the other hand, I think there are certain biological realities and I'm not sure how far it is possible to change them. I wish it were. I wish it were, for example, possible to reverse aging. I'd be very happy at this stage yes. if we could reverse aging, but we can't. And I think that uh, Botox and plastic surgery have very real limits. So I guess at some level, I think we do have to question not how people choose to express themselves. Mm. I guess I would still have hoped, and it turned out I was wrong. And my hope had always been that as we had greater equality for women, at the same time, that would mean less need for people to be bothered by their biological sex. And that hasn't turned out to be the case. And I honestly don't quite understand why that's so. We know that there are large numbers of people now, many more than there have been, yes. who are acknowledging very strong sense of unhappiness with the gender they've been assigned to. All someone like me can do is acknowledge that, listen to them, support them. But I think you can support people at the same time you can ask, you can mm. question how far and where does this come from. Yeah, well, I suppose there's a few things, isn't there? I mean, the thing that I think about in terms of for the transgender community at this point, at least, and it's something that Catherine McGregor talks about, who's probably one of Australia's most prominent transgender women, and also a conservative as well. So, you know, when you talk about gay people, I guess the percentages within the population mean that, you know, a certain percentage of people tend to fit within this particular sexual categorization. But then for transgender people, traditionally, and even up until this point where the numbers are increasing, it's still a very small percentage of the likelihood that lots of people in the community would have an opportunity to interact with transgender people and break down some of those barriers is much less. Probably, although, yeah. of course, there are societies in which there are very clear and understood roles for people who don't fit traditional gender. And that's true, actually, for most societies outside the industrialised West. It's the way that the society explains it. I mean, essentially, the, the construction within the society in terms of how they explain a role within the society is what you mean. Well, I think that... There are so many issues bound up in this, and I think that part of the problem is that there are so many varieties of the trans experience, because there are trans people who are very clear that they are not the sex they've been assigned to. If it's a woman, she's very clear she actually wants to present and go through transition to become a man, if it's a man and the reverse. But then there are people who say, I don't want to be restricted by gender at all. I want to be fluid in my gender expression. So that you get both a radical and a conservative expression of trans identities. And it's often complicated because it's not always clear uh, which is which. Now, you mentioned Catherine McGregor. I think that her political conservatism is as one with her gender conservatism. And she's very clear she wants to be a woman in a fairly traditional sense. I know people who are trans uh, who have exactly the opposite view. They say, I don't want to be a woman or a man, as they're currently understood. I want to move between the two and to not be identified as either. And I think that part of confusion for a lot of people is we're never quite sure which person we're talking to. Mm. Well, I know I talked to um, Professor Jenny Graves, who's at La Trobe University, the yes. geneticist, and we talked about this and she talked about the potential of, uh, you know, we, we can talk about a biological continuum, you know, in terms of biological yes. sex. Yes. And you certainly have people who are, uh, you know, X, X, Y, uh, and then transgenderism in terms of the, the genes, that, that there is a biological reality underneath there for, for transgender people. It's not just social constructionism. It's not just that we get our well, gender. I think because Jenny would also, I mean, I have huge respect for Jenny. Yes. Who, uh, we go back a very long way because we, we know each other from student politics days, actually. But I think she would be very careful to say that there may well be biological genetic explanations, but they're not total explanation, just as the social is not a total explanation. 
I think the strength of her work is precisely that she's very, very cautious, as I understand it, in, in any type of simple, you know, here's the answer. Do you think, though, that the explanation, this is uh, my impression, has become a social constructionist explanation within the community, within, say, the gay community or the transgender community? I certainly can't speak about what may or may not be the view among people who are trans. Mm. Um, I think that this term community becomes very, very misleading because it sort of assumes there is a view. Mm. And of course, there isn't a view any more than if we talked about Jews in Australia. There is not a view. Uh, there are Jews who are passionate defenders of uh, Benjamin Netanyahu's government and Jews who are bizarre opponents of it. Yes. So I think we have to be very cautious about assuming communities have views, individuals have views, but communities I don't think do. Some people that would fit within the LGBTQI, and not every, I'm not talking about everyone, but their political beliefs might be more centre-left or left than they're likely to be leaning well, to think, conservative right. Well, I think, Mark, there is no evidence for that whatsoever. There is actually counter-evidence, I'm afraid. I wish oh. there weren't. But if you look at the federal parliament, there are more openly homosexuals sitting on the conservative side than on the other side. I happen to think this is a very sad reality, but it is a reality. And we just don't have the data. Mm. Uh, and, of course, we can't have the data because... To have the data, we would have to know exactly who is each of those letters. And given that I think sexual and gender identities are fluid, they move over time. Uh, somebody who 10 years ago was in a heterosexual marriage today may be living with someone of the same sex. It becomes very, very difficult. And in fact, it's certainly true that where there have been studies, people who are openly lesbian and gay in the US are much more likely to vote Democrat than Republican. I don't think we have any good data in Australia and certainly we do have evidence that uh, there is an extraordinary range and as I say, just look at the current federal parliament. I mean, it comes back to the utopia thing again, but I was interested in your meeting with Michel Foucault and, and his influence, I suppose, in terms of gay liberation and, and the literature? Well, I don't think Michel Foucault had any particular influence on gay liberation because gay liberation preceded him. I think that Foucault has had a huge influence on the way people have thought and written about sex. And certainly there's a whole generation of people who have been inspired by Foucault's work. I, unfortunately, don't have very good recollections of what he and I talked about. It's this terrible thing, you know, afterwards you realise yes. you uh, had dinner with the world's most famous philosopher, and the only thing I really remember is his, I thought, quite silly uh, defence of the Ayatollah Khomeini in Iran. And I remember that very clearly because it was the period when the Shah was overthrown and the Ayatollah led the, the revolutionary movement in Iran. But I think certainly his influence and his importance in scholarly terms has been enormous. I think his influence on any sort of movement has been remarkably small. And I think that's actually an interesting paradox. But what I'm struck by is that the profusion of queer theory over the last 20, 30 years has actually had very little to do with the growth of a very extensive and complicated queer movement. I don't think this is true for other social movements. I mean, I think that uh, feminist theory has had a much more direct influence on women activists than queer theory has had on queer activists. And I think that's an interesting conundrum. In your book, you talked about both Foucault and Gore Vidal, the attraction and disdain of these intellectuals for their sexuality to be understood politically. And I, I wondered what you meant by that. I'm not sure I linked them. I certainly would link Vidal, Susan Sontag and Patrick White, so we can have an Australian in the mix, yes. um, all of whom were remarkably unwilling to think of their sexuality in political terms, which, I mean, they were very unwilling to give any support 
to the emerging gay and lesbian movement. And in all cases, there was something a little odd, and I think uh, one would have to say a certain degree of self-loathing going on. Yeah. Uh, I don't think the same was true of Foucault, but Foucault was a bit younger, and yeah. Foucault did actually have a little bit to do with the first substantial gay newspaper in France, Le Gay Pied. Uh, in fact, it's believed that he gave the name to that paper. So I, I wouldn't see him in quite the same way, but I think that Vidal, Sontag, White... They do all stand out as people who, on the one hand, people knew about their sexuality and they reacted sometimes quite vehemently against any suggestion that they should be supportive of queer movements. I think the thing I remember about Michel Foucault from distant things I've read, I think I read The Order of Things, that he said that heterotopias were better than utopias. That's the thing that stuck. Yes, well, I have to admit, I don't remember that. Certainly, I've read some of Foucault, but I'm not a Foucauldian, and yes. I'm not really qualified. No. <laughs> I'm sure no. you're right, but I don't yes. remember it. No, it was just an odd thing that stuck in my head. But I wanted to thank you, and, and thank you for the time you've taken to speak sure. to me. It's um, been fun. Deep Trouble is produced by Steve Charman in the studios of Main FM, Castle Main. The Deep Trouble podcast is presented by Trouble Magazine at troublemag.com. Thanks for listening. <laughs>